Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, um, congratulations on not drinking beer outside in the sun. You've made the right choice. So, um, I'm half of Haunted Machines with Natalie Kane, as uh, Arian introduced, and we've recently been very interested in uh, the implications of rendering technology on discussions about truth and knowledge production and things like that. So I'm just here to lay out a bit of context for this panel. Um, and of course, we're talking about image manipulation, which isn't really a new phenomenon. We, we're, I'm sure we're all familiar with the, uh, the images of uh, Joseph Stalin, who uh, during the purges edited out people who were no longer favorable to his regime of the photographs. And it's easy for us now in the 21st century to look back at these and sort of uh, laugh or mock at how simplistic they were, and it seems unbelievable that people would have gone along with this notion that these, these images and these events simply never happened. But these images illustrate an important point, which I guess we're all familiar with, which is that images and all media artifacts do not exist in a vacuum. They exist uh, situated and embedded in the political context in which they are deployed. So in the context of uh, Stalin's uh, dictatorial regime in Russia, the state was the sovereign power of truth. Whatever the state said was true, unquestionably so. Which means that these images were never critiqued, they were never questioned, because the simple capacity to do so was never available. Uh, of course, the technology has moved on significantly since Stalin's day. Um, and in the last 10 or 15 years or so, we've seen a rapid increase of um, new, cheap, and efficient CGI technologies. This, for example, is Blender, which is a free a uh, desktop app which you can do very quickly, uh, photorealistic 3D modeling in. I'm going to check the videos playing. Yes, I've had bad experiences. Um, uh, and, and Alan Warburton does a fantastic breakdown of the history of these technologies, how they're found in uh, CGI and come out of studios from Disney and so on and so forth. The point is that now, you know, this Blender is free. It only requires a laptop. It requires about an hour or so to produce a good image, which means that we're becoming, we're developing a culture that's more and more suffused with rendered imagery. More and more uh, rendered imagery finds its way into the wild. As an example, um, as of 2014, 75% of IKEA's uh, catalog images are renders. The uh, economics of this, of course, are, are, are obvious. It's much cheaper to pay a couple of folk to sit in front of computers working from CAD files than it is to kind of uh, you know, manually assemble all the different thousands of items of furniture that IKEA need to photograph and put them in studios and get the lighting right, do the photographs, get the editing done, et cetera, et cetera. It's an economics of scale. It's an industrial, uh, an, in, an industry now of CGI production that we're living in. A great example of this uh, uh, in industry and some of the power in it is uh, the Chinese company Crystal CG. Um, and they're one of a number of render farm companies that basically produce CGI images for developers and architects around the world. Crystal CG produced tens of thousands of rendered images of developments and towers and so on and so forth. And as with any industrial practice, we end up with homogenization. So as the standards of the software are kind of ironed out and put down, and as the standards of the aesthetics are put down and the most desirable images find their, their greater success, we have a Shazam effect, where the most desirable images are simply replicated over and over again, and all developments and all uh, architectural renders begin to look the same. Bernard Stiegler refers to this as an industrialized memory that is the result of aesthetic conditioning. And Carl de Salvo writes brilliantly that the Im these images have power because of their visual strikingness. It's obvious to say it, but the simple fact that these images look so real and so powerful makes them very difficult to critique or question in the way that we might a sketch or a collage or something that was obvious in its construction. These images aren't designed to be questioned. Uh, Liam Young has a very interesting project called Renderlands, uh, which was an exploration of this industrial CGI landscape where he uh, spent time in, a, in an Indian render farm that works a lot with Hollywood production companies and he used uh, assets that were never deployed for use in actual film production to make a fictional romance story about two of the renderers falling in love. And the last few years have seen a significant, more significant increase in this technology. And until very recently, it was incredibly difficult to render non, uh, sorry, to render organic objects. So non-organic forms like cars or buildings are quite simplistic, but organic forms and particularly human forms have always been tricky because you know, we're neurologically predisposed to recognize them as fakes. Um, uh, Lil Michaela has already been mentioned in this conference, but it's worth drawing out the significance of Lil Michaela as opposed to other digital avatars like uh, Hatsune Miku or, or, or the Gorillas, is that she was just produced by two artists on a laptop. She wasn't produced by an entire huge production team. She is also, again, similar to Stalin Im Stalin's images, a product of the particular political landscape she finds herself in, which is that of social media. 
Um, Eric Davis brilliantly writes of, of a notion in his, uh, in his forward for the re-edition of Technosis in 2001 of the anxious animism of the technological landscape. He talks about this idea that we rationally know that technological artifacts, whether they're gizmos and gadgets or even renders, are not alive. We know that, but we cannot help but feel that they are. We cannot help but build an empathetic bridge to them. And that's down to an issue of assimilation. We still haven't figured out where these renders sit in our culture and what value they have and what their limits and opportunities are. A historical parallel of a similar time was um, uh, the introduction of cinema into popular culture, the introduction of film into popular consciousness. Uh, this is the arrival of the mail train by the Lumiere brothers, one of the first pieces of uh, film ever seen by mass audiences, and it's accompanied by an urban myth may or may not be true, that people ran out of the audience screaming because they believed that the train was going to hit them. The, the kind of aesthetic sensibilities of what film could do had not yet become acclimatized into culture. So people responded to the way they had always responded to a train coming at them, which was to get out the fucking way, frankly. So th this question of assimilation and how we tell stories in it leads to interesting side effects, which is really what this panel is assembled to discuss. This is a, a contemporary example. If you Google image search military drone right now, this is still the second image that appears. Um, but this image is very significant because it was one of the first images of drones. So it was used a lot in 2009, 2010 when drone programs were being exposed and discussed openly in the media as a kind of placeholder signifier for what we're talking about when we talk about a drone. Of course, it's a render. It was a fake, not a, not a malicious fake. It was done by a, a, a Cinema 4D enthusiast and posted to a forum. Just happened to be a very large image, which is why it was picked up and used a lot. But it, by, by reproducing this image, by constantly putting it in this discussion of what, um, what drone warfare is used for and used, and used uh, in, the, in the aim of, we have shaped our aesthetic sensibility already. So, the image has been assembled to sort of conform with what we might assume. There's a, a Leonardo's Electronica for a couple of years now, is the growth of machine learning as a rendering uh, tool. This was published last year. I'm sure everybody saw it. Uh, a team from Washington University, sponsored by Samsung, managed to create a, a very simple uh, neural network that could accurately replicate Barack Obama's facial movements, trained on uh, video footage of Barack Obama. And since then, this technology has kind of skyrocketed. Um, they can now do it with much less training data. They can do it with basically any faces. They can, also they can also match it to a voice synthesizer, all sorts of things like that. The implications of this are very obvious and very widely discussed. The ability to instantaneously fake a politician or, or, or someone in a position of power's words have obvious implications for how we might uh, understand a narrative. Uh, in 2018, I did a project, a very simple project, which was looking at this code. I was very interested in the kind of politics around why this, this project was done and why it was released. Uh, justifiably, the scientists involved attracted a lot of criticism for releasing the code openly and just putting it out there. Because obviously this has the potential to be deployed maliciously and to be used abusively, and in fact is. Because the, the first phrase in this panel, deep fakes, comes from the practice of replacing the faces of pornographic actors with either celebrities or people you want to shame or bribe. And that comes from this same technology. But I what I found remarkable about this is how small the code was. There really wasn't much. This is 48 sheets of roughly A4 sized acrylic. Most of it is just libraries and dependencies. The, the, the actual code that the Washington scientists created was very simple, very, very basic, but extremely powerful. So that's the kind of context we're in. Um, that's the kind of world we're in. I think we're in this interesting period where we have these two phenomena running into each other. And the first is the simple, cheap, industrial production of uh, rendered images that appear visually striking and realistic that we still haven't really found a way to kind of assimilate effectively into culture. And the other is, of course, as we all know, the increasing societal tendency to decouple truth from knowledge, which has remarkable impacts for how this type of technology might be deployed if we don't find better ways of talking about it. Thank you very much.